Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, damas y caballeros, mesdames y messieurs, the World Federation of Engineering Organization uh, and the Peruvian Engineers Association give you a warm welcome to this conference, Engineering Resilience in Disaster Risk Management for Sustainable Development. Side event of the seventh UN Forum on Science, Technology and Innovation, where the book of the same name will be launched. I'm Jose Bachare and I will be today your Master of Ceremonies. For the opening address, I invite Dr. Jose Vieira, President of the WFEO. Please, Jose. Okay, thank you very much, Jose Machare. Our chair of the WFO Committee for Disaster Risk Management. Respected UNESCO Assistant Director General for Natural Sciences, Excellency, Dr. Shamila Nair Bduel. Dear immediate WFO past president, Professor Gonke. Dear WFO past president, Dr. Marlene Kanga. Dear uh, Chair of WFO United Nations Liaison Committee, do, uh, Dr. Gunalan, distinguished co authors of the book we are uh, released now and speakers on this event, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening to all of you. Welcome to this event of launching the book Engineering Resilience in Disaster Risk Management for Sustainable Development, prepared by members of WFO Committee of Disaster Risk Management and five invited co-authors. This is a remarkable and very exciting event. And uh, as the president of WFO, I am very pleased and honored to be part of it and deliver this short opening address. First of all, I would like to congratulate the editors, Jose Machare and Lizette Lopez, and all the co-authors of the book for their excellent work. I am particularly happy to see that this event demonstrates the effective commitment of the international engineering and scientific community, and in particular, the WFO, to finding answers and solutions for disaster risk management within the scope of United Nations Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development Goals. I also want to thank Dr. Shamila Nair Duel for her generosity and kindness in sponsoring the launch of this publication. Thank you very much, Dr. Shamila, for your permanent support of WFO initiatives. As you probably know, WFO is the international organization for the engineering profession, founded in 1968 under the auspices of UNESCO, with more than 100 national and international engineering organizations, and is very committed with the global agenda of the sustainable development. Following this, its mission, WFO aims to promote the culture of disaster risk management through the dissemination and of application uh, knowledge and best engineering practice at local, regional, and global level. This publication released today is one more realization of this desideratum of our federation. The second UNESCO engineering report, Engineering for Sustainable Development, stresses that climate change manifested through changes in atmospheric and oceanic conditions will impose increased and new risks on many natural and human systems, notably through the frequency and magnitude of extreme climate events. Extreme events demand sustainable and effective technical solutions for climate change adaptations and disaster risk reduction for increased society resilience. And these requires special planning and management approaches 
with a paradigmatic shift from crisis management to risk management with hazard analysis and vulnerability analysis in a changing environment. I am convinced that the role of engineering and engineers is fundamental in providing those innovative solutions to reducing the risks associated to natural hazards, notably tsunamis, earthquakes, floods, droughts, and landslides. On the other hand, I am also sure that the participation on this event of WFO, UNESCO, and the International Science Council as the major international organizations in science, technology, and engineering will have the impact that is advocated for a greater and increasingly influential voice of the engineering and scientific community in finding solutions and measures to manage natural disasters, both in developed countries and mainly in developing countries where the vulnerability of infrastructures and societies is most evident. Finally, as president of WFO, I reiterate the willingness of our federation to cooperate with those international partner institutions in providing valuable expert advice and capacity building in this critical societal issue of disaster risk management and resilience. Success to this event. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, President Jose Vieira. Now for the launch of the, for the, launch of the book, uh, please let's welcome Dr. Shamila Nair Beduel, UNESCO Assistant Director General for the Natural Science Sector. Please, Jamila, Shamila. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Machari. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my great honor and pleasure on behalf of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization known as UNESCO, your home. It is my great pleasure to welcome you today at the launch of this publication entitled Engineering Resilience in Disaster Risk Management for Sustainable Development. Before I continue my presentation, I want to sincerely and humbly thank the World Federation of Engineering Organization for organizing this event in the margins of the STI Forum together with UNESCO and other partners. I want to thank WFEO's Committee of Disaster Risk Management for collecting the good practices to show that engineering is contributing to the challenges of disaster risk management. My particular thanks go in, uh, to Dr. Jose Vieira, the president of WFEO, to the organization's former presidents, Dr. Marlene Kanga and Dr. Gonke. Last but not least, my warm thanks to Dr. Jose Machare, who is the chair of the Committee of Disaster Risk Management for coordinating this wonderful publication. And humble thanks go to all the experts and scientists across the world, engineers who have contributed to this exceptional publication. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the 20th century has saw unprecedented movements in the standard of living for millions of people around the world. Electricity has given billions light after dark. The internet connected continents at lightning speed. Transport evolved from horse and cart to space travel and vaccines were developed for some of the world's biggest killers such as tuberculosis and polio. But our work is far from over. Many challenges still remain. Over 1.1 billion people still lack access to electricity. Some 2.4 billion people lack adequate sanitation and 663 million still lack access to clean water. There's much to do by the engineers of the world. This is why UNESCO is working with WFEO, with governments, with international partners and experts to strengthen the engineering education by developing quality curricular training programs. 
For example, UNESCO has teamed up with WFEO to highlight the need for green technology and women engineers to be incorporated in applications of engineers, engineering disciplines across the world. We need more women engineers, and we have an exceptional example of Dr. Martin Kanga and previous presidents of WFEO. Ladies and gentlemen, every year millions of people are affected by disasters that claim lives cause severe infrastructure damage and exacerbate poverty among the most vulnerable. From 2000 to 2019, we have seen 1.23 million lives that were claimed. It has affected 4 billion people, these disasters across the world, and it has cost $2.97 trillion in economic losses. This year is not shaping up to cause any less suffering. Some countries are still dealing with the COVID, some are having to cope with COVID and other hazards in peril. In January, an earthquake struck Afghanistan. In addition, two months later, another earthquake hit Ecuador. In January, Tonga experienced a very rare case in modern history, a volcano-triggered tsunami. Only last month, my own country, South Africa, some 500 people died in severe floods, 40,000 people displaced, and over 12,000 homes destroyed. This demonstrates once again that disasters can strike anywhere, anytime, and they spare no one. Moreover, climate change is influencing the frequency and the intensity of water-related disasters. The growing human and financial costs of these tragedies is pushing risk reduction up the agenda across the United Nations system and in countries. Although the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction to 2030 is our roadmap in this domain, other global agendas, including the SDGs, the Paris Agreement on Climate Action, and the new urban agenda, all have targets that will only be attained if we manage to limit our exposure to disaster risks and get prepared. UNESCO is using all of its expertise in the natural, social sciences, education, culture, and communication to build a global culture of resilience. We are working with countries to develop early warning systems to make critical infrastructure like schools safer when disaster strikes, which is why we are so grateful to this partnership with the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, with whom we have established since over 50 years a collaboration. In sites and territories designated by UNESCO, such as the World Heritage Properties, the UNESCO Biosphere Reserves, we are fostering risk prevention and post-disaster response. We are supporting countries through the use of modern tools, and these tools may be high-end technologies, such as artificial intelligence, big data, or nature-based solutions, such as rehabilitation of mangrove systems to reduce the strength of waves, protect the coastal populations, and also protect the coast from hazards such as erosion and storm surges. Excellencies, dear participants, engineering plays a crucial role in all of UNESCO's work to reduce disaster risk, be it soil engineering, coastal river engineering, structural engineering, hydrological engineering, electrical engineering, environmental engineering, seismic engineering, or some other field. This new publication, which is being launched here today, tackles the complex challenges of reducing yeah, yeah, yeah. risk it describes the cascading effect of the natural phenomenon, the damage to the physical system, the impact of the disaster on the social economic fabric. We owe this publication to those engineers across the world. They have demonstrated the vital role that engineering plays in infrastructure and data management. They have recognized the critical role that engineering plays in building resilient societies. In March last year, 2021, UNESCO, together with WFEO, launched an Engineering for Sustainable Development report. This report was, would not have been possible without the undying support of Professor Gonke, Professor Marlene Kanga, Professor Jose Vieira, Professor Gunalen, and all the other experts and engineers across the world who contributed to this exceptional publication of Engineering for Sustainable Development. We also thank the Chinese Academy of Engineering and the International Center of Engineering Education in China for their collaboration and support. In this report, we have identified and highlighted the critical role of engineering towards all of the 17 SDGs. But there's one chapter that focuses on disaster risk reduction. It recommends using science and engineering 
to better understand disaster risk in all of its dimensions and to better prepare communities. It recommends strengthening multi-stakeholder cooperation between engineers, specialists, policymakers, civil society, and the private sector to improve the governance of disaster risk and improve the way in which disaster risk is managed. Excellencies, dear participants, that report also recommends using engineering to enhance disaster preparedness for effective recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. In order to foster resilience, the report also recommends that the both private and public sectors must invest, invest in prevention. The report lays particular attention to the most vulnerable, especially our small island developing states and Africa. The publication we are launching here today echoes the recommendations of the UNESCO WFEO engineering report, which I just mentioned. And I'm confident that not only engineers, but practitioners will learn from the practices described in the publication being launched here today. UNESCO is delighted, honored to be able to collaborate with this exceptional group of engineers. And we work together hand in hand with you to raise the profile of engineers to manage disasters across the world. Congratulations to WFEO and to all the engineers across the world. Thank you very much for inviting UNESCO to be part of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Nair Bedouel, for your words. Uh, now uh, we will proceed uh, to a brief presentation of the book contents, and this will be done by the leading authors of each of the five uh, chapters on behalf of the 18 uh, authors, the writers, 13 of them uh, belonging to the CDRM and five invited specialists. Uh, they hardly worked on uh, within thematic groups for more than one year to do this. Um, so a uh, big thanks to uh, every one of them. Please, one minute. We thanks, of course, uh, to the Peruvian uh, Engineers Association. Thanks uh, to the CID for hosting the, the committee and for providing facilities for its operation. Thanks also to WFEO authorities and staff for their trust and permanent encouragement. Finally, uh, many thanks to uh, UNESCO to the American Society of Civil Engineers and the International Science Council for their valuable, valuable contributions to this uh, ceremony. The main uh, objective of uh, the book is to display the contribution uh, of the disaster risk management to uh, resilience building of societies. And in this context, to highlight the role played by engineering. Um, in fact, this is not a, a theoretical uh, treatise. Instead, it is based on a number of case studies in different countries, from which the best practices 
are derived. To achieve this, working groups were formed to discuss on five key subjects that finally became in uh, the book chapters. Uh, you can see there, when it, the land use planning to manage the risk, especially in very urban and uh, city growth uh, zones, uh, the design and development of infrastructure systems, the effective exploitation of information and databases, the strategies for capacity building, and the public policies and institutional robustness. The ultimate goal is to achieve resilience while advancing the sustainable development goals, especially the uh, one the number 11 on sustainable cities and communities. Now I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Karel Van Kura from the Czech Association of Scientific and Technical Societies to uh, give an overview of the chapter one uh, land use planning. Please, Karel. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's my uh, honor to present the first chapter, which is called uh, Land Use uh, Management, Land Use Planning and Engineering. Uh, land use planning is quite important nowadays in countryside as well as in uh, cities, even more in the cities, highly density, uh, densely, densely inhabited. And uh, land use management nowadays form the environment where we live. Uh, and engineering is a quite essential part of different studies and uh, development plans, etc. So more uh, such general information you find in introductory chapter of uh, this part of the book, which is the only uh, contribution that I done by myself. But I wish to present the uh, contributions of other authors. And the first one is a uh, professor, Barbara Norman uh, from Univers University of Canberra. She's a leading chair and professor of urban and regional planning. She describes uh, extreme wildfires in Australia from 2019. If you remember, Australia has lost uh, over 400 lives there. And uh, let's say uh, response to this disaster was a creation of so-called uh, National Royal Commission, which together with uh, villages, local governments and inhabitants prepared uh, bushfire planning regulations uh, in order to minimize urban development being constructed in uh, high fire risk areas. Uh, second contribution of the same order concerns coastal inundation. It's also from Australia, as you know, of course, uh, most of people in Austria live on coast side. So uh, result of uh, this engineering work uh, was uh, actually detailed mapping of risk. And uh, the importance of this uh, contribution is that uh, detailed mapping of this risk became a part of land use planning. I have told it uh, in uh, one minute here, but uh, this uh, was work for almost 10 years. So it's uh, not always a piece of cake to implement all these actions in countries. Uh, I wish uh, uh, present also a second order from the same university. 
and this is Hitomi Nakanishi. She is an associate professor at the Urban and Regional Planning Chair, and uh, she describes earthquake and tsunami from Japan in 2011. Uh, we Europeans can hardly imagine uh, something like a tsunami and as a uh, half million people lost their lives and uh, uh, what was the problem after the tsunami the government start to uh, relocate people to more safe areas and who didn't want to be relocated uh, the second choice was to accept protection wall which was five or ten meters high on the coast side and uh, try to imagine case as a fisherman village where the people are connected to the sea and they should uh, or they would like to continue uh, their job as a fisherman to be settled to other place or to live with uh, such uh, uh, let's say wall which cut them from the sea so read the book it's uh, really interesting uh, how it went the last but not least contribution is uh, written by eric ma uh, he is uh, from uh, uh, national weather service if i uh, have the right information and he describes uh, technical solution in hong kong Hong Kong is, uh, according Sustainable Cities Index, uh, rated as the most endangered city by natural disasters in Asia. Uh, despite a high expansion, uh, exposition, sorry, exposition to hazard event, Hong Kong has a high standard of resilient infrastructure and engineering inputs to the town planning process is certainly one of the official uh, crucial factors in achieving resilient city infrastructure so uh, the common point of all this contribution in the first chapter is uh, how uh, example studies provide some insight into managing disaster through better land use planning. Uh, so it was a little bit difficult to describe all contributions. Please read the book and I give the floor to the second speaker, not to exceed five minutes time. Goodbye from Prague. Thank you very much, uh, Karel. And let's continue to the uh, chapter two. There is a video. Hello everyone, I'm Dave Brunsden from the New Zealand Lifelines Council and Engineering New Zealand. And it's my pleasure to give you this brief overview of Chapter 2, Resilient Infrastructure Systems. I would like to begin by acknowledging my co-authors, Stefan Schauer of Austria and Karin Borshadid of Ghana, along with uh, the other working group members who have contributed to this chapter. We focus in this chapter on physical infrastructure, the water, energy, communications, and transportation networks. We regard these systems as the enablers of the other elements of societal infrastructure, such as health, finance, education, and governance. Physical infrastructure systems also have a high dependence on engineering and other technical input. The diagram on the right conveys the, the nature of the interdependencies that exist between the firstly the physical infrastructure networks and then secondly to the other societal infrastructure components. And we're all aware of the potential of failures within one infrastructure system to cascade both geographically and across to other systems. 
A key starting point in looking at the resilience of infrastructure is to consider the different components. And while our minds invariably think of the importance of having robust assets and networks with redundancy, there are other considerations. Firstly, the need for appropriate resource commitment by infrastructure organisations in order to progress meaningful resilience improvement. The associated point is having effective collaboration with all members and stakeholder parties across the infrastructure sector and establishing these relationships prior to a disaster uh, so that they will also uh, be highly um, valuable after a disaster. And finally, reflecting on having uh, an end user community that has firstly realistic expectations around what can happen to infrastructure networks in various disasters and being appropriately prepared for that. Whether we're talking um, critical facilities like hospitals that have to have the highest levels of emergency backup services, right through to commercial um, premises and households. Each of the, the considerations in the previous uh, slide um, provide different approaches to uh, improving uh, resilience of infrastructure. And some of these, of course, at a relatively modest cost. So building upon those, we highlight three important um, considerations in the quest for greater infrastructure resilience. Firstly, understanding the influence of ownership and the regulatory systems within which the uh, infrastructure providers operate. It's the reality that organisations in private ownership have a greater need for a commercial return on resilience projects compared to, for example, community owned networks. Clearly, there needs to be uh, a, a careful taking account of interdependencies in planning infrastructure development and infrastructure improvement, resilience improvements. And the key point here is that it requires planning and implementation across organisational boundaries. Um, successful infrastructure resilience work at the community level can't be just managed from within individual infrastructure asset management plans. Perhaps the greatest challenge is, is actually ref, uh, taking the opportunities when there's significant new infrastructure development to reflect on um, the, the, uh, the robustness of the original infrastructure facilities. As we look back and think that uh, many of our uh, um, uh, um, first infrastructure uh, locations of critical facilities are not in the, in the positions that we would choose today due to what we now know about the vulnerability of the ground or um, with respect to flood levels. And so having a, uh, a thought um, at the time of further development um, can uh, uh, presents an opportunity and, and a real challenge. But it, it's something which is particularly important with regard to climate change. So the key overall theme in this chapter, therefore, is the overall of importance of uh, focusing on organisational relationships and for infrastructure providers to work together collectively and innovatively in order to achieve greater resilience. The main message is for us as engineers to be constantly aware of opportunities to improve the resilience of infrastructure systems and the different considerations as we go about that task. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for chapter three, uh, I invite uh, now Dr. Fan Chen from the uh, International Research Center for uh, of Big Data for Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you, Jesse. So, uh, first, I'd like to, uh, it's my honor to share the whole message from this chapter three. 
And the first time that we introduced the co-authors for this chapter, they are from the, their name is uh, Maroka Rodriguez from the uh, uh, Federal uh, uh, Institution of the, uh, Costa Rica. And also the, our two colleagues from uh, the Central Wiki, and Dr. Bang Lee from the, the International Research Center of Big Data for Sustainable Development Goals. And also I would like to thank for the, the act, experts from the International Society for Digital Earth, ISD, and also the uh, Integrated Research on Disaster Risk, IRDR, and also the World Academy of Sciences, TWAS, who give us the wonderful suggestions and comments to make this uh, chapter work. And uh, this chapter, the key message for this, this chapter focuses on the data and information management for the disaster risk reduction. Because this, uh, this is the key issue we think is important for the DR, disaster risk reduction. Why? Because currently we all notice that the digital infrastructure, also the big data and also the AI and other modern technologies provide us uh, new opportunities for the uh, disaster risk reductions. But thing is, uh, even we do have the emerging uh, technology exist, but uh, the, we meet, we do have the challenge on the how we can improve the access to the multiple source of data and how we can integrate all the data together to address the new just like disaster risk reduction issue. So, and uh, we noticed that uh, even uh, we have the technology we still need the platform, the wonderful the, the channel for us to use and share the data. So we also noticed uh, there are many, just like the several data platform uh, use the big data platform, just like the big earth data cloud platform developed by the, the, the International Research Center Big Data for Sustainability of Those Savers, and also the group of observations all provide the useful, just like the online platform to share the actionable information about the data for the DR. So this is all valuable. This is the, the existing knowledge we already have, but we do think that there are many challenges for us for the future disaster risk reduction. Next slide, please. Uh, Josie, next slide, please. So the key message for this uh, chapter is, uh, the data is huge and existed, existed. But thing is, when the, our users would like to use the data from the engineering view, we, the first step is we need to uh, uh, standardize the, all the data and the methods. That means that let the data and the methods in the way people can understand can easily be used and in the same standards. This is the first thing to uh, get data and method messed together. The second thing is that if we have the data, but the thing is that we need to improve the accessibility to exist digital source of the DR. That means that there are several databases already exist, and we need to bridge all the data sites together. So that means to improve the accessibility of the data. And the third is that we have data, we get the data, more important, we need to use data. So we need to have the capacities to effectively utilize the different types of the data source to help us to address the challenge of the disaster reduction. So how we can benefit from the data is from the ability to use the data. So this is the third message we would like to, uh, to share from this chat. And also the uh, most important thing is that disaster is related to the uh, people. So most important thing is who uses the data? It's people use data. So the most important thing for us is we need the much more people, skilled people, skilled the, 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 the experts and enhance our human resource capacity to use the big data on disaster reduction. So that means the people should know the knowledge of the disaster and also people should have the skill to use that big data. So this is very important to, uh, to, to just like gather all the information together with people. So this is the so four uh, key message I shared in this chapter. So, and uh, this is only the part of the, our understanding. So, and we hope we can share more, much more information from the future WFOEO reports. Uh, here's my key just information we'd like to share today. Thank you very much. Uh,
uh, I would like to give the floor to next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fang. Um, if there is any uh, comment or, or questions uh, from uh, the public, uh, please include it in the, the chat log, and we will try to answer uh, them, uh, if not now, uh, after afterwards uh, by, by mail. Uh, for chapter four, capacity building, uh, I invite uh, kindly the, uh, Professor Ashok Basa from the Institution of Engineers of India. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Professor Dr. Joe Vieira, President, World Federation of Engineering Organizations, Dr. Somalia Nair Bidole, Assistant Director General UNESCO, learned speakers of today's functions, and my dear friends around the globe. At the outset, I welcome you all to this gala side event of United Nations and STI Forum. The chapter on capacity building has been dealt by Osok Basa from Institute of Engineers India, Zoe Makare from Peru, Dr. Valentina Putino from United Kingdom, Astro Muna from Spain. Friends, resilience is the capacity of a society to cope as a system with stressors related to its development by withstanding, adapting, and recovering related to their impacts. In a world that is fast-paced and subjected to the increasingly more frequent impact of natural and man-made disasters, it is required for the society to become more adaptable and more inclined towards a fast change of directions, both in terms of policy making and in developing a self-content capacity building to cope with these new stresses. Initially, disaster management involved activities after the occurrence of the disaster, such as relief, rehabilitation, and reconstruction, known as 3R. However, radical changes in the concept of disaster management were brought in by the three world conferences in disaster risk reduction held in Yokohama in May 1994, Hugo Kobe in January 2005, and in Sendai in March 2015. After these world conferences, approach towards disaster management has been shifted from post-disaster reactive approach to a pre-disaster proactive approach. From response to preparedness with prevention and long-term mitigation measures involving planning, preparedness, and prevention, known as 3P. Disaster, particularly natural disasters, cannot be prevented, but its effects certainly can be reduced by capacity building. The figure clearly shows that the three levels of capacities are interrelated and not mutually exclusive. All the three levels need to be taken into account while determining who needs what capacities for what purposes. In the chapter on capacity building, it has been highlighted how the self-content capacity of the society can be strengthened and what are the strategies to adopt to make people feel more ready to manage risk and become more resilient. Three case studies is dealing with one natural disaster such as cyclone, volcanic eruption, and earthquake have been elaborated to emphasize on these aspects. Now, what are the key messages? Next slide, please. Joe, next slide, please. Yeah. The first one, creating a nodal organization to coordinate all activities before, during, and after the disaster. In many countries, including India, Philippines, Bangladesh, Peru, such nodal organizations have already been made. For example, in India, because of such organizations like National Disaster Management Authority at the national level and Odisha State Disaster Management Authority at the state level, during Cyclone Phony 2019 in Odisha, 1.2 million people could be evacuated in just 48 hours, creating a global record thanks to the success of early warning system and the OSDMA authorities. Similarly, the target to achieve zero loss of human life was achieved during the Cyclone EAS 2021 in Odisha. Both these brought in global appreciation 
to the state government of Odisha and the central government of India. The second one is making a vulnerable atlas of the entire country, identifying the valuable areas affected by different natural disasters. Updating the engineering codes of practices to design and construct structures resilient to the disaster. National Disaster Management Plan explicitly aligned with Sendai Framework 2015 be made by all the countries, imparting training to the people about do's and don'ts during the disaster. Awareness of risk and involvement in its management should start since the childhood. Afterwards, the active participation in disaster risk management activities is perceived to be normal to everyone. Thus, the continuous capacity maintenance comes from inside. And finally, fulfilling everyone's role is best performed when the local disaster risk management system is built by all the community stakeholders instead of when it is prepared outside and given as a turnkey system. Friends, in fine, it can be stated that more is the capacity building, less are the effects of disaster. Hence, our motto should be to emphasize on capacity building to build back better from the past damages. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Basa. We um, finished this uh, short presentations uh, with uh, for the chapter five uh, presented by uh, Professor uh, Miles Lin uh, from uh, New Zealand. Greetings and welcome. In this chapter of the CDRM Handbook, we look at the institutional frameworks as they relate to disaster risk management, or DRM for short. We share global good practice and how this can be applied locally. The chapter also includes case studies from both Chile and New Zealand. DRM operates as a social process through four interlinked components, namely hardware, software, financial support, and human capital. These four interlinked components are a complex system of responses provided by many organizations, including government agencies, scientific and academic entities, non-government agencies, and private companies. The degree of institutionality of DRM reflects in the extent to which a society understands these processes and trusts its institutions. A reduction in community vulnerability is the primary reason most countries seek to institutionalize DRM. That's because through institutionalizing DRM, communities are more readily able and consistently practiced at reducing risks. That's because people are more prepared for and consequently better to able to recover more quickly from natural hazard emergencies. While for the most part, financial and technical components of DRM responses can be managed through international cooperation, the human component is often the most complicated. There are efficiencies and other advantages in seeking to use systems and approaches that have been proven to work in other countries. Creating a level of international compatibility also ensures that agencies, personnel, and community members in general can operate and respond effectively when overseas. Moreover, DRM response agencies can more easily analyze and incorporate learnings from overseas experiences into their local practices. It is recognized that adopting practices and policies developed by industry experts and recognized international experience adopted to local conditions greatly improves the overall effectiveness of a DRM system. International agreements such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sustainable Development Goals create a commitment for signatory countries to advance the development and implementation of DRM. The following are some common observations on DRM systems. Aged or outdated technology places infrastructure and other hardware components at a greater risk of vulnerability. The process to institutionalize DRM throughout a country requires consistent investment over many years, independent of the leadership of that country. 
although the general components of DRM need to be centralized, there are benefits of DRM activities being decentralized. Countries that have a higher occurrence probability of natural hazard events are better at embedding the disaster response practices into their communities as part of everyday life. In general, countries that have a higher recurrence probability of natural hazard events often demonstrate two key responses. The first, a consistent and long-standing recognition of the need to have an institutional framework that weaves DRM responses and training into people's everyday lives and two, trusted community-wide understanding of communication and information sharing. During times of DRM response to natural and other events, ensuring and retaining public trust is essential. This is because during response events, communications are often focused on preserving life, preventing an escalation of the emergency, and providing essential services. Being able to maintain law and order and best respond to the needs of the many during these events is heavily reliant on public trust in the communications from leaders. Communications during times of response benefit from being risk-based, non-political, and have community health and well-being at their core. Where community leaders have not accepted the advice of specialist technical experts, such as scientists, engineers, or doctors, the impact on the community will generally be higher. We encourage you to read the CDRM handbook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, now for uh, some comments and also for an overview of uh, the Integrate Risk Disaster Reduction uh, IRDR program. Let's welcome to Dr. Han Chunli from China, Executive Director of the IRDR program. Please, Dr. Han. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to to be uh, here uh, and to give to talk about uh, a new framework of global science to address uh, system risk and the global emergencies. Uh, my name is Chin Li Han, and I'm the executive director of IRDR International uh, Program Office. Uh, I, I would like to first to congratulate the WMEO and the distinguished uh, colleagues uh, for having developed this excellent publication, uh, Engineering Resilience in Disaster Risk Management for Sustainable Development. Um, I just want to inform you all that uh, I, uh, my office will share uh, this important publication to the entire IRDR uh, community. Uh, yes. uh, this, uh, uh, we have this uh, research program, uh, this, uh, the new research framework uh, is developed uh, uh, start in uh, 2019 uh, after the uh, last uh, global platforms on DRR uh, in 2019. Uh, there was a kind of number of issues that has uh, has been uh, recognized internationally. Uh, uh, well, everybody has been uh, working on the disaster reduction. Uh, we realized there's a uh, uh, a uh, variation of the definitions of the risk and the, the ways of framing the risk uh, uh, in, in different ways. Uh, the sec different sectors have uh, different views on the, on the risk and sometimes over, uh, overlook them. But more uh, importantly, it's, it's a system of risk and the cascading risk has uh, get more and more attention. Uh, the disasters uh, has intensified in terms of uh, numbers and frequencies uh, uh, in losses and damages, uh, and especially in uh, showing the systemic way and the cascading effect. So that worries the international community uh, and uh, the UN agencies like uh, IRD, UNDR, 
and also International Science Council. There are many discussions in the communities dealing with the ICBGs and with the, the risk analysis. Uh, it shows the, the, the a lot of connections between, uh, you know, the issues of the water, the land, the biodiversity, oceans, the climate, and the disaster risk and, and the safety of the communities. And of course, the COVID-19 uh, has been uh, such an enormous uh, impacting to, to all the sectors of society. That is probably, unfortunately, uh, uh, the strongest uh, example to show the systemic nature of the risk uh, we are facing today. So in, uh, uh, during to, uh, 2020, 2021, uh, 21, uh, in uh, about 18 months time, the, under the leadership of uh, UNDRR, International Science Council, uh, IRDR has worked with many, including WFEO. Uh, thank you for the expert designated by WFEO for this huge teamwork of over 100 experts to develop a framework for global science in support risk-informed sustainable development and the planetary health. This is in the website of UNDRR, uh, IRDR and International Science Council. Uh, what it contains, uh, the document, is the, uh, the challenges on climate change, uh, the interconnections with SDGs and other crises, uh, and, uh, and also to deal with how in the risk uh, uh, control, risk management uh, as, as, uh, uh, as a whole, how we do business in the future. Uh, there are many aspects that have been addressed, but the most important uh, of this document is that the, a consensus on nine research uh, priorities. The first one is about understanding the risk of creation and perpetuation in the present uh, risk landscape. And uh, the agenda also uh, recognizes that the inequalities, injustice, and the marginalization is a huge a challenge, huge problems. Uh, enable transformative governance uh, and action in DRR has been called by Sunday framework and the need to be pursued. Uh, there's a lot of discussions in the DRR community uh, led uh, uh, by the UNDRR and the International Science Council. There are uh, two important publications about the hazard definition and the classification review and a technical report. Uh, several hundred pages, in, in which it, it shows uh, a shift of the understanding of the risk uh, from the traditional uh, the risk categories to those related with the climate change, with the uh, uh, public health, but also with the other things like the, the conflicts. The number eight, measuring uh, to ha help uh, uh, drive uh, progress. It's uh, similar to what uh, people do in the SDG uh, indicators uh, system, which is uh, a system we needed to, to establish. And the number five, the harness technologies, data, and the knowledge for risk reduction is what many communities are doing, but especially the leadership has demonstrated by WFEO and the engineering community. Uh, this is the, in the IRDR, well, we are doing uh, 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 research, uh, but we do have a, a community, connect, strong connection with the engineering community. This is coming from Japan. Uh, the, for the IRDR, uh, the uh, summary of 10 years work, there are, there's a book about the 30 innovations of DRR. In that, you see uh, the work related with uh, GS remote sensing, uh, with new machines, re with the building code, engineering building code, and with the new materials, with the new design of early warning systems. This is, uh, uh, in Japan, there's an a, a effort to connect the research agenda with the uh, practical solutions. Another example is coming just recently that we are collecting the cases for uh, the uh, the uh, next uh, GP DR in Bali, uh, the Nepal, uh, a small uh, young professional uh, community uh, group has uh, built up this uh, uh, BI pad, 
a model to integrate all the information on the risk uh, problems for the local uh, municipalities. 40 municipalities in Nepal has benefited from such an uh, uh, effort. Now, with the new research agenda, we would like to advance the IRDR for next 10 years. The, our overall mission will be science for an inclusive, safe, and sustainable development world. And with the three uh, major functions, in particular in improving knowledge, understanding of risk, promoting innovation in research and action, and explore effective solutions, and building institution capacity. Many of this had been uh, mentioned before. This is my last slide that uh, we del deliver RDR program through the pillars of national committees, uh, young scientists program, international centers of excellence. We have 18 uh, across the world, uh, but we also have strong partners. We would like very much to explore further with the WFEU and the engineer communities for practical solutions to reach the, to uh, got cro uh, across the last mile and uh, reach the communities at the local level. And uh, two new uh, uh, elements in the IRDR will be building uh, work streams and the pilot studies and the project. For the work streams, we expect, uh, for instance, in the big uh, data uh, field, we would like very much to work with WFEO uh, and uh, uh, experts to develop uh, such a, a, a re, uh, work streams for the future. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Han. And uh, we have put the, the, the WFEO uh, website, uh, where you can download the publication. Uh, and now uh, for the closing remarks, we have uh, three outstanding WFEO uh, members. And uh, we would like to uh, start with Dr. Uh, Gongke from China, um, WFEO past immediate past president. Thank you, thank you, uh, Jose. I think I have observed a big success, uh, which will symbolize a new uh, starting point of the engineering uh, works on uh, disaster, uh, uh, disaster uh, uh, reduction, uh, disaster risk reduction and management. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, webinar symbolizes this new start, not only by the launching the new uh, booklet, which uh, provides us a, a really comprehensive multidisciplinary insight into the problem, especially engineering resilience on disaster management for the sustainable development, but also uh, symbolized by bringing together WFU and ISC, IRDR teams. Uh, I personally uh, firmly believe WFU contribution to the IRDR is very important. That will turn the IRDR uh, produced knowledges into engineering norms, standards, hand, project handbooks to guide engineering practice and to turn this knowledge into physical resilient infrastructures benefit for all people. I stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gongke. Uh, now uh, I invite uh, Dr. Marlene Kanga that has support uh, strongly the work of uh, our committee too. Please, Marlene. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all those attending this very important uh, webinar. Uh, this is a very important occasion because it marks the very first time that UNESCO and its disaster risk management uh, uh, unit, uh, the International Science Council and IRDR, and the WFEO Committee for Disaster Risk Management have come together to share their knowledge and with a very important objective 
uh, to build capacity in the area of natural disaster risk management uh, for engineers around the world. My congratulations to all the authors of this very important publication that has been released today under the leadership of the chair of the Disaster Risk Management Committee, uh, Dr. Jose Mashare, and congratulations also to the authors. This book brings together the expert knowledge from engineers around the world, and it is a great example of the power of WFEO to be that, set, that focal point for this kind of collaboration. And I'm very pleased, as Professor Gonke has also mentioned, that Dr. Hahn is here and presented the work of the IRDR. And I think there is tremendous opportunity for further collaboration um, in the spirit of SDG 17. Uh, and also, I would like to acknowledge the, the support of UNESCO, uh, the Assistant Director General, Dr. Shamila Nair Bedurel, and also the unit uh, uh, in disaster risk management, uh, Dr. Sochiro Yasukawa, who assisted us uh, in, in the final production of this book. I'm sure this book is going to be very invaluable to engineers all around the world. And it is a, a great example of how engineers can can collaborate for sustainable development so that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Maureen. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Kanchipuran Gunalan as the chair of the WFEO uh, United Nations Liaison Committee to give the uh, final words and thank you for, to all of you for your participation. Thank Please. you, Jose Mashare. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you. This is a, a milestone in terms of accomplishments of you and the committee. And uh, thanks to the UN Interagency Task Team on STI for SDGs, convened by UN DESA and UN CTAD for and the 10 member group of high level representatives appointed by the Secretary General for giving us this opportunity to, you know, organize the site event and the launch of this great work of many, many folks uh, in the field of disaster risk management. Thanks to again uh, to UNESCO and Dr. Shamila Nair Badeo. Uh, for uh, for a continued support uh, in encouraging uh, engineers around the globe in helping uh, improve the quality of life. Uh, as Jose Mushare pointed out, I think in the chat box, there is a link to the book, or if you can go to WFEO's website too, you'll find the link to download the book. And as many have pointed out, this is just the beginning and, and a framework. The hard work starts now. So my thanks to all of you and my best wishes to uh, all of you. And thanks most importantly to the participants who have taken the time to be with us this morning and to share this event, a successful event. Thank you very much and a good day to all of you. Appreciate it.